From beautiful East Tennessee in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, you're listening to the Sherry Voluntary Show, and I do appreciate you spending your time with me. Uh, today, I have a really interesting guest, and I think you guys are going to uh, like it a lot. Um, his name is Jim Mo Jimmy Morrison, and uh, he's a father, husband. Uh, he's a former Gary Johnson campaign staff worker, and he's also a documentary filmmaker. Uh, he has made a film that will eventually be two films called The Bu the Housing Bubble and then The Bigger Bubble will be the second one. So, Jimmy, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks, Sherry. Glad to be here. Great. So, I, I now, I, I we were talking before and you said you'd worked for Gary Johnson on that campaign. And, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about, was that your first foray into politics or had you been a libertarian for a while? Or? Uh, so, I kind of had a free market bent, but I would describe myself as more Republican. Um, I was anti-FDA at that point, but I really didn't have like a knowledge of the Federal Reserve uh, until I started making these movies. Um, but I had gotten into politics a little bit in high school. I did a uh, debate club um, until I started having like anxiety attacks and didn't know what was going <laughs> no. on. So, I just quit and didn't pursue it. And then uh, later in high school, I actually, they held a John Kerry rally in our school and like encouraged all the students to go. And then anybody that had like dissenting opinions, they took away like their signs and stickers and stuff. Wow. And uh, passed out signs that said like Muscatine for Kerry and stuff. And it was broadcast on C-SPAN. And so I actually walked out of school and called into the state uh, talk radio in Des Moines. Uh, it's 1040 WHO gets picked up like all around the country. And so, so many people called in to complain about this, that the principal went home early, which I was pretty proud of. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> uh, it's a good education right there in how politics actually right. works. <laughs> right. And so I actually, I wrote a letter to the editor about like bias in schools around that time. And there was just such a huge backlash from like the public and teachers and everything that I really like got out of politics for a while. And like, mm -hmm. I just didn't even want to talk to people about it. Yeah, but uh, awesome. after a few years of pursuing film and uh, I had a house painting business, um, I decided to get back into economics uh, around the time of the crash. And so, <laughs> I mean, it was after the crash. I certainly didn't predict it by uh, having a house painting business. But yeah. uh, so that's when I got back into it. And that's when I learned about all these things. But learned about real idea economics. <laughs> yeah, right. But the idea was to attract on people that predicted the crash and ask them why it happened and you know, what, what would be coming so that I wouldn't make the same mistakes. Cause I really got caught up in the bubble right at the tail end. Uh, so it was yeah. terrible timing on my part. Yeah. My, my sister became a mortgage broker right around the time. Oh, yeah. And so she was, she, she learned how to do the job and then she had no client. Like it was just dry yeah. instantly. Right. So she found other things to do, <laughs> but, uh, I, I thought Great. something you said at, um, when you were screening the film at the Mises Institute, and uh, I, you said something that was, you have to give high school kids a break because they they need to live through a Democrat and a Republican administration to really see that there's not a whole lot of difference in the, in what what goes on and, and to kind of get a, a broader understanding of that. I thought that was really insightful because I think yeah. a lot of times people give millennials a really hard time for being socialist, but right. who isn't? <laughs> Right, right. I mean, everybody's believed stupid things. And, yeah. uh, you know, we all believe stupid things today. We just don't realize it yet. Yeah. But, yeah, I think uh, people can check that speech out at letusdisagree.com slash Mises U, M-I-S-E-S-U. Um, but it really, I, kind of an interesting, like, take on that speech was I was kind of looking back at, like, uh, if I could give a speech to myself 10 years ago, because a lot of the people there were about 10 years younger than me, 10, 12 years. And uh, so I thought if I could give a speech to myself, like, what would I say? Um, because, like, the month leading up to that, my dog died and my grandpa died. Aww. And so I had a lot on my mind. And so uh, and finally being able to screen this documentary after years of working on it. Um, that speech really kind of summed up uh, the story behind the film, which we actually cut it together with clips from a couple other conferences and stuff. Uh, and that's called The Story Behind the Bubble Films. You can check that okay. out on YouTube or our website, letusdisagree.com or thebubblefilms.com. Great. Not to give any plugs for our website. But. Yeah, no, definitely do. Uh, get them in there. Um, and, and one of the other things that I thought, like you, you said you spent – Oh, you drove 35,000 miles to do these interviews. Yeah. Um, I, I heard you talking about kind of taking like a, a shower in the sink at the Walmart or wherever it was. Um, 
-hmm. and uh, that you were really, this is what I tend to do. And I, I I think a lot of libertarians, uh, you know, we've been, we've been blamed being autistic before. And I think there's a little truth in that because I I've seen it in my own life where I'll get super hyper focused on one thing in my life and then I burn out. Um, And so you, you talked about having balance and that you can't take all of your time to do these things. And so it, it, it sort of took you longer to do the film than you initially thought it would. Uh, But the idea of balance of, you know, playing with your kids, playing with your dog, hanging out with your friends, like we need these things. Uh, And so did you, did you find that that's, sort of continued in your life you've learned how to get more balance in other projects you're doing or yeah absolutely I'd, I'd like to think so at least um going back to my dog a little bit that's something I really learned from my dog I would go on <laughs> runs with him where I had an Alaskan Malamute so he was like a sled dog mm-hmm. he was like you know the best dog ever um but he uh eventually I realized he was always running away but if I went with him instead of just trying to fight him and get him to come back like because really that was his nature was to roam you know Mm -hmm. um but when I went with him he would let me lead the way or he if he was going to change direction he would like wait for me on the corner that sort of thing (laughs) so it started out as just like a way of going out listening to podcasts or economics lectures from the Mises Institute um but it really turned into a a thing where it kind of taught me like okay, I can't only do economics all the time. Like, you have to give your brain a break. You have to, like, spend time with other people or connect to animals or nature or whatever. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it really was a, a, a great experience making the film, but it was also a very long and awful experience. There were yeah. lots of delays. Um, we, we did, I drove over 35,000 miles shooting interviews, and early on in the film, I didn't have the money to really be doing it. Um, and so, and I don't really, to this day, actually, but, uh, <laughs> the life of a but, filmmaker. Yeah, we would, I, I would just, uh, wherever the interview was going to be, I would just drive there and throw everything in my car and go, and I'd sleep in the back of my car or take a tent. And, uh, unfortunately, like I would get super anxious and like a lot of mornings I would unfortunately I have to get out of the car and just throw up because I was so nervous about interviewing these people like Mark Faber and Peter Schiff and Doug Casey and Ron Paul and uh, all these people that predicted the crash um, and then I'd have to go get cleaned up uh, and go to like a bathroom and wash my hair and everything <laughs> so that I could put my suit on and uh, pretend like I was a, a distinguished individual that should be interviewed right people. respectable <laughs> <laughs> right yes yeah, so I guess right. that that really comes down to um the the vision versus reality type thing that you have this vision um and i know i've done this before too like i i even starting this podcast you have this vision of what it's going to be and what you want to do with it and then reality right. is a totally different thing and and especially the smaller your operation you know i'm responsible for almost everything i thankfully i have a, a friend who's a producer and does uh certain jobs for me but you know he might not be there forever so i've still got to learn how to do all this stuff because when you're a small operation, you're responsible for all of it. So I can imagine putting a film together and, and doing all that. It was a big reality shock from the vision of it. It it was humbling to say the least. I mean, our first release date was 2013. So Mm. it's been a long journey. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's just, um, you know, the lessons we learn about uh, being, as you get older and you learn how much time things take and that there are things that come up, then, you know, you learn to kind of say, give right. yourself a little more leeway, but it's, it's a hard thing to do, especially with something you've never done before to know yeah. actually how long it's going to take. Um, there was something else you said right before we get into the actual films a little bit. Uh, you also said something about your, your daughter and I, I, you know, you have two children now, but I guess at the time you just had yep. the one, um, and that uh, it, it didn't change you to teach your daughter as much as it did to watch your daughter teach herself. And as a homeschooling parent and someone who tries to practice peaceful parenting, um, I, I, really, I really loved that. And I think that for me has been true as well, that I've learned so much from my kids. And, you know, they've really helped me become a better person just from being a parent and, and seeing the world through their eyes and watching them grow and, but really them teaching themselves. Like I was sharing with you that my daughter taught herself to read by playing Minecraft because she was so incentivized. She really wanted to keep up with the other kids on the server and she couldn't do that without reading. So, uh, 
I, what what are those? I know your children are very young, uh, but what yeah. did you mean by that? What really, what did it kind of perspective did it give you? Yeah, I mean, part of it is just every day seeing the awe that they have for everything. And, you know, obviously, like, the flip side of that is children melt down and, like, they have terrible emotions and everything. <laughs> uh, you just kind of realize that, like, what you're doing is you're just trying to demonstrate that when shit hits the fan like that, like, how do you handle that situation? Right. And you're just trying to, you know, over and over again, show them the right way to handle things when they go wrong and everything. Yeah. And yeah, I think the example of them uh, teaching themselves language is like such an incredible thing. Like it's so hard to learn a language. And yeah, like it is easier when you're a child, supposedly with your brain or whatever. I'm sure right. that is true. Um, but still, like it's they don't know anything yet. Mm -hmm. They're teaching themselves. They're and like babies even. They're just constantly um, figuring things out. And mm -hmm. It's not that every day you're sitting down with your baby and saying, "All right, we're gonna move this leg." And right. So you're <laughs> all you're just going to figure it out because that's what there's something over there and you want to get it yeah and that's kind of what it was like with the interviews you know it wasn't a matter of like oh man that interview is a 16 hour drive away it was just okay that's right. where the interview is I got to do it that's yeah. uh that's the uh thing I'm gonna have to do and I think having that mentality as a parent of like um you know just having that be your base point of oh, I'm going to have to do all this extra stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that really helps your mentality in the moment to not be like, oh, no, I have to grab this other thing. It's like if you're already expecting to have to grab all these things, it's not a big deal. Right. I was actually talking to a friend about that where um, if you go from like having three kids, uh, if taking care of three kids to two kids, it's suddenly a lot easier. So if you have that, that mentality of, oh, I have to do the work of taking th care of three kids, then the work of two kids doesn't seem like a lot. But if you have the right. mentality of, oh, I need to do the work of two kids, and then suddenly you're taking care of three kids, you're, like, overwhelmed. Right. What's going on. Uh, yeah. So a lot of it is just mentality. And uh, the one of the cool things about learning economics with this film, uh, one of the things with uh, Austrian economics, they talk a lot of things about how things are subjective and mm -hmm. people value things differently. And so coming from that perspective, it kind of made me realize that, like, the time uh, you can, like, value something in that moment but five years from now, you're going to value what you were doing uh, with that time a lot differently. And, yeah. you know, think, thinking about how you're going to value that time differently uh, really makes you just want to, like, hang out with your kids and just play with them. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Doing other things. But going back to the balance thing, you, you got to balance with the doing the work, too. Yeah. Um, but I've kind of gotten to the point where uh, if I'm going to make a mistake of going too far one way in that balance, like, I would much rather it be oh, I went over to the play with my kids instead of, oh, I went back to my computer to get, get more things done. Yeah, but. that's true. I, it is about um, competing values and, you know, what what is most important. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves, like, as much as I love doing this and I want to make a difference, you know, the I've, I've, the biggest and first obligation I have to make a difference in someone's life is my children. <laughs> and right, that's, exactly. You know, that's what... You got to focus on what you can control and influencing them is something you can control. Yeah. And that's kind of something else I talked about in there is like, it's not that like I want to indoctrinate my kids to be libertarians, you know, they can have whatever political beliefs they want. Um, but I just want to watch them grow and uh, mm -hmm. see where they take it. Yeah. I, I do want to indoctrinate my children, but if they reject it, I'll still love them. <laughs> That's yeah. the thing. Well, telling them not to hit people or steal from them doesn't seem to be too right. much to ask. That seems like basic morality, right? I think uh, yeah, right. having kids is, it gives you a real lesson in tyranny too. Like, yeah. Because they, they really, uh, the younger they are, they can be tyrannical. And, right. you know, it, it's it's a good exercise in patience, which I, it's not my long suit. I'm not a super mm -hmm. patient person. I've become far more patient than I used to be. Uh, yeah. but you know, it helps you grow as a person as well. Um, and, uh, I, I like what you said about, you know, incentives that children have their own set of incentives, uh, that are separate right. from ours. We want to get them fed and clothed and grow and safe and all those things. They want to play and learn and, you know, the, our, our incentives can be, are often different for what the things we do. So it's good and yeah. uh, idea and, or good lesson in negotiation on how to get someone who doesn't have the same set of values that you have necessarily as a child to, to go along with the plan and, and move their lives forward. But 
also letting them gu- take the the front seat and guiding that as well. It's it's a really neat like symbiotic relationship that I've I've uh, really enjoyed kind of analyzing over the years a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so That's interesting oh. to think about. Go ahead. No. Oh, well, I was just saying, you know, once you become a parent, like you can't help but think about it all that stuff just because you're watching them grow and they're constantly surprising you. And uh, you're constantly just analyzing yourself of like, Oh, what can I do differently? You know, because none of us are perfect and everybody gets frustrated. Oh, that's true. And and that's for me. I have to realize like uh, my kids get just as frustrated with me as I do with them. Right. You know, I have a right. 16 year old son who's wonderful. He's doing his first job. But tonight he he got called in to work for the first time. They said, can you work for me? And so he had to he came downstairs and he said, I really want my day off, but I could make some extra money. And so we talked about that, like, OK, mm-hmm. so what were you going to do with this time? Is it really you know, what do you what and what's the goal? What do you really want? He's saving for a car. So maybe the the time off has less value for you right now than working extra and, and making that extra money. So it's a good, right. it's a good learning uh, experience. Yeah. It teaches, it teaches people to do cost benefit analysis, yes. which is a very important skill to learn in life yeah. and not something to really talk about in school. Yeah, No, not at all. Uh, so getting to that, getting into the movie now, it's, it's actually going to be two films. Um, like I said before, the, this, First one that's being released in June, June 26th, mm-hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Um, is called The Housing Bubble, and then the sequel will be called The Bigger Bubble, and that'll yeah. come out sometime after. <laughs> I'm in the next eight years. <laughs> in the next eight years. Okay, we'll be looking for that. Um, and so um, I wanted to ask you first, uh, have you always wanted to be a filmmaker, and uh, why this particular subject? For your, this, I'm assuming this is your first documentary, like feature length. Yes. No. Um, so uh, that's an interesting question. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so I actually, I hadn't really thought about this in a while, but when I was in like sixth grade, uh, Goodwill Hunting came out and Matt oh. Damon and ben Affleck got their start by writing a screenplay and actually, mm-hmm. you know, being able to make it. And so I read a biography about Matt Damon and was inspired and wanted to be, I was, I'd been interested in writing, but when I saw that movie, I was like, oh man, I want to be a screenwriter. Um, but uh, whether it was school or uh, society or friends or just me being uh, not having the initiative, like I totally just gave up on it thinking yeah. like, oh, there's no way that I could do that as some guy in Iowa. Um, so I really, I gave up on that. Um, in high school, I became really interested in economics because I had an amazing economics teacher. Um, and so I went to the University of Iowa to study economics. Um, and in 2006, I dropped out to pursue film because I had written a screenplay. Um, so toward the end of high school, really like my senior year, I started writing uh, after my junior year, I guess. Um, and so I'd written the screenplay and I knew if I finished my degree in economics, I'd have a job opportunity um, because, you know, of course, the economy was going to stay great forever. <laughs> and uh, but I knew that if I had that opportunity, I would never would make the movie. And so I dropped out of school to pursue film. Um, and that's when I started the house painting business, because that was going to be my way of funding those projects. Mm. And that was like 2006. So Fun. <laughs> right before the bottom falls out. Yeah. Uh, so so is is the reason that this particular subject had a lot of um, interest for you because of what you went through with the, you know, starting the business and then having the economy sort of collapse or not sort of, I mean, yeah. collapse. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, at that point, uh, I, as I mentioned, I hadn't really like learned a lot about the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, a friend of mine um, had, uh, sorry, I just lost a light. It's okay. um, <laughs> a friend of mine um, had uh, started talking to me about those things and I just didn't believe it. You know, I just mm-hmm. couldn't believe that that was the system. Like, uh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And so I actually, I, I wanted to get back into economics and I did a torrent search for economics and the Mises Institute had put out a free audiobook of Economics in One Lesson by Henry mm-hmm. Hazlitt, Hazlitt, which everybody should read. It's excellent. Uh, it came out in the mid 1940s. And so I was listening to the audiobook while I was painting a house and just had this realization of, man, this guy really described what was going to happen to us all these years ago. So Maybe if uh, somebody doesn't want to make those mistakes again, that uh, they should track those people down that predicted it and ask them why it happened. So mm-hmm. that was really the the origin of it. I 
I'd worked on other documentary projects. I actually followed around my buddy's brother, uh, who was a high school football player that was being recruited, um, and followed around and filmed all his games, but like really didn't know what I was doing, didn't get enough footage for uh, something that I could finish. And I'd, I'd done other like small short films and stuff like that, but mostly what I did was like music videos, um, and I would go on tour with this band, The Color Pharmacy, and do uh, concert videos and that sort of thing. Um, so that was most of my film back. Cool. Um, so uh, th- what do you hope the effect of this film will be um, in the long run? What do you see as as the, you know, what do you really want to come out of it? Well, I mean, honestly, what would be ideal is if people would watch this film and then they would look at the names at the end in the credits and be like, oh, I want to check out those books. They'd start reading those books. They'd go to my website, check out the store, start reading Murray Rothbard, and suddenly they become anarchists and the government's overthrown. Um, (laughs) That probably is not how it's going to play out. Um, but we're just trying to educate as many people as we can and, you know, to have an anarcho-capitalist documentary uh, like this out there where we can actually put these ideas out in an accessible, easy to understand way. Uh, it really could be a game changer for people because if you're trying to explain to your friends or your family or anyone uh, these ideas, like you're really trying to pack so many things into one conversation mm-hmm. and you don't know what the other person knows and you don't know like where they're going to disagree with you and so if you can sit down with them for 80 minutes and watch this documentary then they can tell you oh I really agree with that but I disagreed with this part and you can actually uh, come to a conversation with a, a basis of knowledge um, so I really think it has the potential to kind of take the discussion to a much uh, more elevated level yeah I and I did. I, I really enjoyed the. I watched it twice, actually. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I watched it once. Just um, I was driving back from Chattanooga from uh, doing an interview down there. And I, I listen. I got to stop you. I love Chattanooga. Do you? Actually, I filmed a video with the Color Pharmacy on okay. Signal Mountain. Oh, yeah. They, they stayed out. Uh, they played a show in Chattanooga and they stayed out all night drinking. <laughs> and then I their driver and so I uh, uh, they were coming back to the RV to go to sleep at like six seven in the morning and I said nope we're driving up to the top of single mountain and you're gonna play a song so film it so you guys that out at lettucedisagree.com that's awesome I I grew up there so um it's got a spot in my heart for sure I live in Knoxville now but it's only an hour and a half away so my family's down there down there a lot I love it. Such a beautiful place, yeah. It's become quite a city. It wasn't when I was growing up, but they've they've really done <laughs> a lot to it. Um, but uh, um, where was I going with that? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean. No, that. no, that's okay. Oh, I I listened to it twice, and uh, one was yeah. just coming back, and so I just wanted to to hear it without taking notes and all that, and yeah. I was just I was so impressed with how accessible it is, because. You know, was it was it Mises or or I think that called um, economics the dismal science? Yeah, may, may have not. been Hayek or someone. But yeah. uh, you know, I, it can be that way. Like I I am not an economist, right? I know enough. I have more of a, a basic knowledge of economics than probably most people because of Hazlitt and um, Bob Murphy and things like that. But or people like that. Uh, but this is really accessible, and it's not. You have a bunch of economist nerds talking about you know economics but it's interesting and it's it involves real life and it it really went into the history of um the gold standard the fed fdic things like that that it's not so deep in the weeds that you lose people because everything that was talked about really are things that people are familiar with and so um i i found it very accessible and and i'm looking forward to sharing it with lots of people i think we talked we talked about i'm gonna i'm gonna try and do a screening here i'm gonna try and get glenn jacobs to come to my to my screening see if we can work that out i think that'd be great because He'll yeah. draw a lot of people that would not normally come to a, a you know anything libertarian, but they'll come to see, you know, Glenn and this thing about economics. So uh, I th- I think it's really great, and I think a lot of people are going to learn some things um, about it. And I, the the in that vein, the uh, Austrian ec- economists they have warned about that bubble for a long time. And and that's one thing Austrian economics is really good at. The Austrian school is predicting like business cycles and booms and busts and things like that. 
Um, but nobody would listen. Do you, do you know why? Right. Like nobody would listen. <laughs> well, it's be it's because the data says otherwise. You know, when you're in an artificially manipulated boom and all this mm-hmm. money has been printed and they push interest rates down to zero, like they did after the crash. You know, it makes sense that oh, hey, look, look at the economy. Everybody's doing great. You know, it, it makes uh, it deceives everybody. Um, mm-hmm. So it makes sense that they would get caught up in it. And really, if you don't get caught up in it. Uh, then you really get punished because you miss out on a, a lot of potential profits. And, you you know, if you're shorting the market too early, you're going to just get wiped out. Um, so uh, I think one thing I've really learned in this project is that, like, even though we're learning as much as we can about how the world works, like, we're still just people and, like, we can't predict how millions of people are going to uh, make decisions and what they're going to do. And in a system where uh, literally just a handful of people set interest rates and decide how much money they're going to print, then you really can't predict anything because you have no idea what the Fed's going to do next. Yeah. And so they're, they're the pe- some of the people in the film have kind of been criticized for being uh, bearish for uh, a long time. But if you really listen to what they've been saying, they've been saying, I don't know when this is going to happen. Right. They don't claim to be able to predict the future. All they're saying is that if you print a bunch of money, you're not going to fix everything. You're just going to kick the can down the road and create a bunch of uh, distortions that are going to have to unwind eventually. Yeah. So it just makes uh, everything worse. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that the first film has a lot of history in it. The sequel, The Bigger Bubble, which we actually wrote them at the same time, um, and I was trying to condense them down into one. Uh, I had it as like a four-part miniseries and tried to get it down into one. I couldn't quite make that happen. And so that's why we split it into two films. And I'm really glad we did because we have – Uh, the run-up to the causes of the housing bubble in the first film, and then we go over history like the Great Depression and going off the gold Mm -hmm. standard. And then the second film starts with the bailouts in 2008 and brings it up to today. Um, So it's more of a current events film. So one of your co-writers, at least, maybe maybe you have more, is Tom Woods, correct? That he helped you? Yeah, he was... uh, uh, the first person I actually pitched the project to was Thomas Sowell, and he turned me down. Um, and then uh, I went to Tom Woods, and I'm so thankful that I did because yeah. he is such an incredible help with writing this. You know, just the wealth of knowledge in his books is just, uh, it gave me the structure for the film and gave me everything mm-hmm. I needed to uh, to learn what I needed to, to make this happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Robert Murphy uh, is, was also a script consultant. He wasn't a co-writer, but he did uh, uh, really help me in making sure that I didn't make mistakes and that my sure. my arguments were sound and I, I wasn't uh, misspeaking. Sure. Yeah, it's easy to sometimes over overstate things when when your political position you know whatever happened has been backed up backed up your political right. position it's it can the temptation is to overstate I, I may have done that before myself <laughs> but yeah. I, I do love I think um Tom's a fantastic writer and even yeah. though he can write something really technical and in-depth and something I, I won't read but I've, I've also read a lot of his work, and, and it's very accessible. So, you know, he can speak to two different types of audience, to academics and to right. laymen like myself. So right. uh, I, I've really appreciated that. And I, I could I could sort of I, – I thought maybe this was – you know, he had a hand in that with the, the orderliness of it and how everything yeah. worked. But <laughs> um, yeah, he, he and Bob Murphy are both really good at making things super easy to understand, yeah. taking really – ideas and just condensing them down into just the things you need to know about them. Yeah. I think, um, Bob Murphy's, uh, book, um, economics, or I think it's something for the young economist. I forget. I think it's economics mm-hmm. for the young economist. Um, that's what my son that's has read. For young economists, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Um, Which that's you can a, buy on our- Oh, can you? Okay. That's great. It's, it's a fantastic book. It's the, I think yeah. the only thing that really rivals Hazlitt for, it may even actually be easier to understand than Hazlitt. Um, so right. I would definitely recommend that book as well. Yeah. Um, that one of the things that I thought was really interesting in the movie, and it's not something that you, you purposefully did, but I noticed there seems to be this real like juxtaposition between von Mises and Greenspan in the fact yeah. that Mises turned down a job with the, the Austrian bank because he, he said this is they're not practicing the right type of economics. They're not doing the right thing. Turn that down. Whereas Greenspan, who should have known better, um, became the chair of the Fed. And what he said beforehand to what he said during his, his um, tenure as the chair is incredibly different. 
And uh, right. I, I just found that really interesting. And I, I was floored. And I, I lived through that. But I was probably, let's see, in 2005, I was, I was a young per, younger person. I was in my 20, um, early 20s, late teens. And um, I, I wasn't really engaged with economics yet. I hadn't become a libertarian yet. And so I didn't really value economics. Um, but the more, especially once I got into anarcho-capitalism, I really started to see the beauty of economics and how it's it's not about math. That's what my my conception was before was that it's about math, but it's actually about life and how people behave right. and what are incentives for people to behave in certain ways and how the market um you really see that beautiful invisible hand of the market work and and it doesn't need to be managed, which is really the idea that we have and I don't I don't know of a really truly free economic um, country, free market country yeah. in the world other than the black market. But uh, I thought that was a really, really interesting kind of mirror to each other that these are two two men and, and Alan Greenspan certainly should have known better. But when he said the government can always pay the debt, any, any pro um, loans for people, any problems they get into, because we can always just print more money. I was just like, right. floor. Pretty honest. <laughs> <laughs> pretty honest of it. I, I was i was really it, floored it, it is an interesting juxtaposition because it really is on a, a more like we really try not to look at intentions in the film but if we can right now for a second like mm -hmm. if you look at the intentions behind the two people like all through greenspan's tenure you know he tried to claim that oh i'm i'm doing the right thing and he even tried to claim at one point that he was running the dollar like we were under a gold standard, which wow. is just absurd. Yeah, which yeah. is just absurd. And uh, yeah, to see the contrast of Mises, who turned turned it down, and uh, he he has a fantastic story where he actually fled the Nazis. Uh, mm -hmm. He moved to Switzerland, and then eventually he was afraid of uh, you know the Nazis coming into Switzerland, and so he moved to New York. And so he he lost everything. He had to start over completely, and then he had to start over again. And then after the war was over, he had to make the decision of, you know, do I go back and try to write in German? Do I stay here in New York where I don't really have any opportunities either, but I can yeah. write it or I can keep trying to learn English and uh, do it that way. And so that's when he uh, wrote Human Action, which, uh, you know, all these years later is just impacting so many people. Yeah. Uh, so you just never know uh, during your life. He thought uh, his, his library when he left Austria was raided the day that the Nazis took wow. over. Um, and uh, he thought everything was destroyed. He just assumed it was destroyed, I guess. Or for some reason, uh, they thought there was a fire or something. Um, and what actually happened was they kept it because they thought they would be able to figure out how to make fascism work by reading his anti-government writings. Wow. Like, at his critiques and saying, okay, well, maybe we can just do this. But with the calculation problem, there's just nothing they can do to overcome that. Sure. And so then when the Nazis fell, those papers went to the Soviet Union and they actually kept it thinking they'd figure out how to make socialism wow. work. And uh, after the Soviet Union fell, uh, uh, a phone call was made to the United States and uh, blanking on the name of the guy, but he picked up the phone and they're like, hey, we found all these papers from this uh, Ludwig von Mises guy. And so all his old writings were found wow. uh, in the early 90s, which is just uh, an absolute incredible story. That is incredible. Um, I've never heard that. That's, 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 that's really, um, it's good for us. Good for, I'm sure it was good for Mises as well. Right, right. Uh, that's, that's a pretty amazing story. Um, I, it it really shows you that you should be everything that happens in your life really sort of leads you to the next thing. And you can sort of make of it as you will, like bad things happen, but you know, right. it might, it might turn out better in the end and you can always work and do your best and try and overcome those things. Um, right. I, I was really amazed while watching the, the film too, about the amount of political theater and just flat out voodoo that it happens within the Fed and, and this, the government system of managing the economy. Um, and it really comes down to what people will believe. And, and I think it's, yeah. it has a lot to do with um, the ignorance that people have on economics. And they just sort of tune out and let the, let the authorities, you know, in harsh quote, handle it. And, and that really uh, makes us worse off in the end. Um, so... 
I don't know if there's really a question there. I just. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'll add to that. Uh, that's one of the great weaknesses with the political system is mm-hmm. it requires everyone to be educated on all the issues. And then they have to vote for one person that's supposed to represent all their views on all those <laughs> different issues. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, the kind of the fatal flaw mm-hmm. with democracy. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I thought it was really great, too. And I don't know if you did this on purpose, but. It was brilliant in my in my estimation. Uh, there was a part in the film where um, the, it, it's uh, it's about a quarter of the way th- through, and it's George W. Bush, a clip of him, and then there's a clip of Bill Clinton, and there it's basically it, it could be, have been one speech altogether. Yeah. It clips back and forth of them speaking, and they're saying exactly the same things. Yeah, um, it's the same speech that you just cut back and forth, and it's yeah. the exact. Same. It was by. amazing. Uh, and if that, then you have like um, Bernie Frank, uh, Barney Frank at the end, like mm-hmm. he's saying the same thing they were saying. So yeah. it, that, that to me was just a real, um, very expository of the fact that they're not different. And, and this is what I try to explain to my friends. Um, and I, I've gotten to do on the local radio station here for about three hours every week uh, on another show called Real News. But um, that they are all the same. Like people tend to think that because of issues, the polit- the two political you know duopoly system is they're they're different ends of the spectrum. When really it all comes down to force in the end. They all want to force you to do things. And uh, I just really I thought that was a really good illustration of that. Is that they all. They might try and manipulate you to convince you. And if they if they can't do that, they'll just flat out force you. Like nobody gave up their gold willingly. Like it was it was forced. Yeah. And so um that that's where they, they it all comes down to the same thing that it's about violence in the end. And uh I, I really thought that it was an interesting point that was brought up in the the film too about um war. And and really you see how so much of this is ties back into war and that um, the war, the Fed funds the wars so that the politicians can keep making wars without the consent of people. So people tend to just not care because they're not paying, they can't connect any difficulty to that actual war. Right. They don't see the cost directly. Yeah. They, they don't think they're paying for it because their taxes didn't have to go up to pay for the war, right. which is exactly what Bush did. He said, we're just going to ramp up all this military spending and and it's going to be OK. Right. And then we thought, <laughs> oh, the peace president Obama is going to come along and he's going to change everything. But yeah. clearly that's not what happened. Either, yeah. So. And then Trump's going to drain the swamp. Right. And yeah, he's right. No, it's not gonna <laughs> and he's going to put us back on the gold standard, even though every right. speech he says practically he says he wants interest rates lower and i think that's a big part of the trump phenomenon is you can just go into these crowds and you can say a bunch of Mm -hmm. things and they're gonna pick out the one issue that they're like all right well you know it sucks that he's so crazy on all these issues but i agree with him on this one issue and that's my issue so i'm gonna go with it i too want to make america great again (laughs) (laughs) yeah right or with obama i too want hope and change like neither one of those things may mean anything they don't actually tell you the means by which they're going to meet that end it's just yeah. this is what we want and so people fall for slogans and and some of that is on them because you know if you're not going to critically think then you'll be led by that um but I, there's so much we could talk about we are coming to the end of our time um and i just i would really highly encourage everyone to see this movie because i think even if you are a long time, you know, you understand economics very well and you're going to enjoy it because it really gives the the reasons and, and the many moving parts for why this is able to happen and why it will happen again, because they are doing the same people are still in charge. And so they're, they're still doing the same thing, things the same way. Um, one thing I did want to ask you uh, was uh, what are what's the big takeaway if you have one uh, you maybe you don't but do you have a big takeaway or a few things that you've learned from making this film that you think changed your outlook on Mm -hmm. economics or libertarianism or the world whatever yeah absolutely so i would say that uh uh first of all what i mentioned earlier that just like you know at the at the end of the day you don't really know 
anything. Like you can't make other people uh, conform to your views and way of the world because uh, you don't know what interest rates are going to be. You don't know what other people are going to do. And, you know, you don't even know what you're going to do uh, years from now. So um, I guess that would be the first thing. Um, but uh, the, the main point of the movie is just, hey, don't print money. Like it's that simple. Like, <laughs> don't print money. Don't try to mess with prices you know you yeah. can't just dictate prices for millions of people that really causes a lot of problems because yeah. uh, those prices are trying to tell people information mm -hmm. uh, if there's uh, you know a, a famine or a bunch of floods where people aren't planting a lot of crops you know the price needs to go up so people know that so that they don't waste those resources um, but uh, yeah so the main point of the, the first film really is don't print money uh, we get into the responses a little bit in the history section uh, and kind of cover like the responses to the Great Depression, the responses to the Panic of 1920, and kind of look mm -hmm. at different ways that they've responded to crashes. Um, but the second film really gets into it with all the bailouts and everything. So that's the other big thing is don't print money, don't bail out banks. Yeah. Like, uh, that, what, what gives that, you the right? Yeah, that the market businesses failing is a market signal that they didn't do business very right. well. Right. And the, it, it, all these things, I was talking with someone who's another anarchist, not necessarily of our, our variety uh, recently, and they wanted to just get rid of money. And so we were mm -hmm. talking about why money is valuable. It's a tool, not just in its value, but as a tool right. and, and knowing prices is important. And this is why, you know, if, if, you want socialism to work, the best way to do it is not to be socialist. You know, I mean, yeah. if you want. This... Well, I would hate to, every time I want to go buy a book or something, I have to sit the author down and say, hey, yes. will you sit down for 80 minutes to watch my movie and then you can give me a copy of your book. So, yeah. you know, money, money has benefits. It's just that the system we're in where it's manipulated, mm -hmm. um, it, it really can, can hurt you. Um, you everybody kind of uh, looks at uh, it, it, it's just being normal that prices go up every year. Mm -hmm. But in the 1800s, before we were printing all this money, uh, prices would go down. Uh, and every few decades, right. like education would become cheaper, healthcare would become cheaper. Um, and so I, I think that's something that's important yeah. for people to realize too, is that like, it, it's not just a, a normal part of the system that yeah. you're, you're always up every year. Yeah. yeah. That, that's really interesting that you say that. It, it reminds me of just the amount of bureaucracy in our lives now um, with yeah. whether it's, you know, federal government, state government, or even something like uh, with public schools, the consolidated school districts where you can't just go down to your neighborhood school now and affect any change. Principal principals for one don't have much power anymore. And two, you yeah. to get to someone who actually makes change happen within a school system you have to go find your school board find out when they meet go there and then you may not even right. be heard like it, there's just more bureaucracy between um everyone and of course as uh anarcho-catholics we want bottom-up governance and for you to be able to look anyone that you've given any sort of authority to in the eye and be able to uh, get to them as they say <laughs> you know right. you, you want to be able to tar and feather them if they need tarring and feathering <laughs> so yeah uh, but I, I think um the great lesson from this documentary too I think is that if there's a crisis in this country it is one of economic understanding that there is such a lack of basic economics um that people are fooled easily and this, I, I hope that this will be sort of a teaching tool. Um, one more thing in the arsenal, like I always, when someone wants to learn more about anarcho-capitalism, I generally send them to first to Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard, and then second to um, The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose. And this is going to be another go-to thing for me. I already know that because... Hey, it's so that. easy to understand, and I, I, I hope this has a huge impact, and I think it will. Um, so I, I look forward to try and do in a screening here in Knoxville, and um, I really appreciate coming on the show. Would you want to tell everybody your websites and things again, and do you yeah, have any other course. projects I, coming up? Uh, I, I really appreciate you having me on. Sure. This was a lot of fun. It was nice talking about parenting because it's not normally what I talk about. Yeah, so. <laughs> thanks. Yes. Um, uh, but yeah, the website's thebubblefilms.com. If people want to go to the New York City premiere, uh, it's letusdisagree.com slash NYC. Um, and uh, our panel is going to have Tom Woods, Jim Grant, Peter Schiff, Gene Epstein, uh, David Tice, who is our executive producer, 
uh, and myself, and it's going to be moderated by Liz Clayman, who's an anchor at Fox Business. So awesome. we're really excited about the event. It's going to be awesome. It's at the Angelica Film Center. Um, but then we're going to be releasing the first film, The Housing Bubble, uh, that same day. Um, so people will be able to get digital copies that day. Um, and then our Blu-rays and DVDs will be shipped out in July. So we're really excited to get the film out. Uh, it's been a long road, um, but we've really, you know, we spent these extra years trying to make it easier to understand and more accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, 20 years from now, uh, our hope is that this will be the definitive documentary on the housing bubble mm -hmm. and we'll still be able to be impacting people um, all those years yeah, later. I, I think Maybe. you were successful. And I, I think that, you know, just taking this one um, era in U.S. history, you learned so much about economics just through that, just looking at that a little deeper and, and the history of how that is even possible, how it even happened. So, um, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And what, what was the name of your other website? Um, let us disagree.com. Yeah. Let us disagree.com. That's the name of my production company is okay. let us disagree. Great. Production. And so people can go there and they can get Hazlitt's, uh, econ book on economics. Um, also, uh, there was one other thing. And now I've forgotten. But anyways, I appreciate you coming on this show. Right. And uh, I look forward to maybe talking on the, when the next one comes out. And, and yeah, uh, sounds go good. For... I'll be happy to come back anytime. Great. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Take All care. Right. Thank, you. Bye. Thank you. All right, guys. If you enjoyed this content and you'd like to support the Sherry Voluntary Show, you can go to patreon.com slash Sherry Voluntary and your, uh, your support would be much appreciated. Until next time, peace.